Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I think we can begin at this point. So thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Lauren Mackler, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this virtual talk and tour of Zach Harris's show, uh, Zero Hour, which is currently at Birotin Gallery in New York and up until April 17th. So welcome. Hi, Zach. Hey, Lauren. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> um, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to the show first, and then Zach and I are gonna chat for about half an hour while clicking through slides of the show to give you a little bit of a sense for the space and the pieces. And then at the end, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. So you can submit a question at any time using the chat function, no, sorry, using the Q&A function on your screen. Actually, the chat is gonna be disabled, so. Um, and I'll look at them at the end and then I'll sort of, um, moderate them to stack. Okay, so an introduction. Um, so Zero Hour is Zach's first show with Birotin in New York, though not first show with Birotin, and not first show in New York. <laughs> um, originally from Northern California, you lived in New York for a little while, um, or quite a while, and then returned to LA about 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Um, and that's where we are today. We're um, beaming in from Los Angeles. And I will add here that I'm really honored to be speaking to you, Zach. I'm a great admirer of your work and we're friends, almost like family. And also, as you were saying, we're about 30 feet away from each other because I'm your studio neighbor. <laughs> and essentially living in a house that you built or have reworked. So I feel like there's, um, I've been following the process of the show from the beginning and also kind of immersed in some regard into your aesthetics. So I'm excited to talk to you guys today about it and to you. Um, so Zero Hour um, comprises 10 paintings, mostly large scale, each one incredibly unique and requiring um, a long look. As far as painting techniques go, um, most of them are, all of them are on panel with um, carved wood that creates these shifts in depth and light perception. A lot of them have linen inserts that involve a mix, or the paintings as a whole, I guess, involve this mix of great painterly skill and then this kind of conscious de-skilling, almost like doodling, and that's kind of a part of the process. The pieces are often structured in, um, and Caitlin, we can kind of click through at least the install shots for a moment while I start to talk about this. The pieces are often structured in multiple planes that reveal themselves as you approach them or spend time looking at the pieces. And they often have these kind of larger architectural lines that are planned and more mathematical, but then extremely detailed sections that are much more improvisational. Um, they're really essentially worlds within worlds or kind of frames within frames, which is something that we'll talk about um, today. As far as process goes, they take a lot of time. They're made over time. And in this case, you kind of gained a few months, right? Because the show was postponed uh, through a COVID delay. So that's been kind of added to the process. As far as subjects go, they deal with historical, mythological, pop cultural references all kind of colliding. And, you know, I had the great pleasure of writing about the work for the show. Um, a mix of personal interpretation and synthesis because it was the result of many of these kinds of conversations that we're going to have today. And I will say that there wasn't really enough room to put every, in my writing to put everything that you talk about within the pieces, but there are a couple of through lines or kind of conceptual threads that I feel like we can maybe begin with, including the notion of time being very much a part of the exhibition. Um, a shifting conception of time as announced by the title, but also through specific elements like clocks, calendars, film strips, um, a meditation on duration. And then as another kind of through line, um, there's also in this show an overall or a kind of recurring imagining and imaging of the apocalypse. So I'm imagining that we're gonna talk about these themes and more as we talk today, but. If we begin by clicking over to Grandmother Clock Tower, which should be the next one. Zach, I thought I would begin by asking you about this, about time, like about um, how you conceive of time in painting, and then also about this particular piece and the title. I imagine there's a lot to say there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, title, the, the title of the show, like you said, is Zero Hour. And that's kind of like the negation of time or something and not so much time, but like measured time. 
and zero hour, like you can't measure these artworks in terms of hours. It's not like an industrialized production. And it's also about like the, the rupture of time and you lose track of time to kind of out of your head make it in the aesthetic experience, you know, whether you're the maker or the viewer. So it's like, it's that. And then also it's like ZH, my initial zero hour. And um, so it's, it's kind of like the theme, like you were saying very eloquently. And then um, this piece is called the grandmother clock. So instead of a grandfather clock, which is kind of based off of, I kind of just switched it around, like thinking about time as this, like kind of patriarchy or oppressive patriarchy that we're always living in like hour how much do you make per hour like we're so stuck in this sense of repetitive product productivity in terms of time and measuring time and like i want the artwork to kind of give an alternative offer an alternative to the space and time to kind of what we're like so kind of brainwashed into in our culture and so this piece, it's kind of like, so I got into making clocks and calendars, like you're saying, and this was sort of modeled like, it's kind of like part grandfather clock, part Egyptian obelisk or something. And it's kind of art deco-y a little bit. And um, it like the, the top of it where the clock face would be is kind of, instead of a clock face, it's kind of more like a sun, like a radiating sun. And I was thinking like, oh, like the first, way to measure time was the sun was like the original clock or something so it's kind of like radiating this yellow orangey kind of light and that light is then kind of like in the whole show like a lot of the pieces in the show have this kind of warm like sunsetty fiery light that's kind of symbolic kind of like has like an apocalyptic feel but um so there's sort of like a light to the show just kind of all emanating from this like all seeing eye which I kind of think of it as too, like an eyeball. And it's actually like CNC milled that, mm -hmm. uh, that top part. So those are like plies of wood that you're seeing revealed mm -hmm. in the top, you know, and, and it's like done on the computer and, you know, rendered perfectly. So there's like a certain perfection in it that's not by hand, which is gives it this kind of otherworldly, like futuristic -y feel. So that's, that's sort of like the top of it. And then it's kind of emanating down these like Pentagon shapes going down. Um, I don't know if we have a detail shot. We could uh, look at some detail shots. Yeah. Yeah, so there's like one of the bottom Pentagons um, and you sort of see this like mythological creature. I just kind of created, it's kind of like a Zodiac figure, but um, it's kind of like this cascading down. And then around it is, those sort of stripes, is it, it looks like very chiseled and three-dimensional, but it's actually, it is actually carved in space and relief, but it's only maybe like half an inch. So the whole, and then throughout the painting, there's parts that look deeper than they are, parts that are carved, but they're painted as if they're not, or they're heightened. So it's this whole like highly illusionistic Trump Loy feel where you're kind of like puzzling inside the piece like trying to figure out what what you're looking at exactly and how the space is operating you know and it also depends on like how close you are to the piece because the piece is like almost 11 feet i think or 10 and a half feet so and it's kind of the drawing like kind of comes up so it almost looks like it's taller than you than it really is it's like illusionistically going up like a skyscraper or a tower or something mm. and um i just I'll try to be briefer, but, uh, and then like this part, there's little sort of kaleidoscopic windows here. And these parts actually are oriented with the golden section ratio, the spacing of them. And I, throughout the whole show, I tried to use that ratio, like whenever I could to make an aesthetic judgment or construct something, I would use that. Cause it's just, it, there's like an orderliness to it. And again, it has this otherworldly perfection about it and it kind of implies infinity you know because it's like the sequencing is so perfect the way that it gradates smaller and smaller and smaller in the same proportion so you know these pieces are you know they yeah they take a lot of time and there's a lot of thought that goes into it and this is like inlaid and yeah, there's a level at the bottom and 
I could talk about that too. So there's a lot of like wood inlay in these as well. And then you can see like a piece of wood on the bottom. And so that's a little bubble level. And it's kind of like a play on the utilitarian nature of a clock. And it's kind of a joke too. Like you want the painting to be level and it's like a self-leveling object. So it kind of emphasizes the objecthood of the artwork. You know, it's not just like a painting. It's kind of a construction and a thing. So, and I had this thing about like, oh, the, the like you mentioned in your press release, which is, you know, the clock, the clock is the time with the level is the space or something. So yeah, it's like this truth right. factor that orients the whole piece and is down the bottom so that you kind of know, you know, that this, this kind of universality. So anyway, sorry to talk so much, but um, no, there's I, a lot to it's so interesting. There's so much in what you just said. It's interesting that in this particular show, there are a lot of different paintings that actually feel very much, I mean, that are kind of objects, like there's a harp, there's this clock, there's this table, you know, there's this kind of mantle. Um, and so I think when you described, I've heard you describe it, the level as kind of stressing the objecthood of the painting, which is important in the way you talk about the paintings, because they're also um, they really play on their depth. Some parts of them are so flat and so much just about image and some parts of them are so um, dimensional, even in a kind of metaphysical way. Um, but I also wanted to rewind, rewind to something you said very early on in responding about a uh, grandmother clock where you talked a little bit about the painter's time versus the viewer's time or, you know, those two experiences of time when looking at the painting, I feel like also a distinguishing quality of your work is that there's this initial read as you enter the space, which we all did by looking at these install shots, then that read is kind of more architectural. And, and sometimes, you know, you can get a little bit closer. It's a little bit more like furniture or like object. But then as you enter, you get closer into them. I guess the time of looking is a big part of these works, whether it's, you know, in, drawn into the clock itself or, um, I don't know. Is there anything that you could say about that? Like the time of looking at these pieces, I guess. Yeah. Um, could we switch the detail shot? Maybe see a few others to, um, but yeah, I mean, I know like we had that, that was part of our discussion was like, and you mentioned that in the press release that I was like, oh, I kind of equate the, the time that I spend on it with the viewer's time. And like, if I get lost in it, the viewer would get lost or if, you know, like I kind of, sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I, I was just saying, I think that's something that I remember that was something you had said to me once that there's this kind of really meditative experience that the painter has as they kind of like fall, fall into the process of making the images, a kind of like um, improvisation in image making. And that the viewer has this experience when looking at them where they discover these kind of layers. And that's, that's right. what I remember to be creating the mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a sense of like the, the value of the artwork partly being or like the deeper message of it. Like there's a subject matter, which is like, yeah, there's a lot of time and clocks and things you can kind of linguistically describe. And but then like the, I think of it like the deeper kind of message of like how the artist is approaching the, the process, the studio practice and the process and, and like how much um, like I kind of like using worlds within worlds and certain parts are broken down into like kind of sub roles. Like, yeah, like this here, this is a landscape painting that I actually did from life like 10 years ago in upstate New York. And I kept it and then I kind of inlaid it into the, the painting. And it just like, it has a different kind of aura to it. And it's a different materiality and it was done in different times. So like, I kind of like having like this pocket this shape, this painting within a painting within a painting. And then each, each kind of shape has its own history and kind of uh, visual language as well, you know, and, and then, or different material and then sort of like collaging all that together and then trying to like envelop it all in a kind mm -hmm. of light, you know? And like in this one, you see these kind of two dinosaurs kind of looking up at this kind of meteoric event which is, I was thinking of like, the, you know, the, the meteor that destroyed the dinosaurs. And then down below the painting is called Curtain Call because there's like curtains hanging around this kind of 
this painting, which could, could look sort of like a movie screen or something. And then down below is like a kind of camel sky dinosaur creature looking up at itself, you know, or in the past or in the future in another kind of time and space. So I try to like layer the images of the painting. Like if we can zoom out on this one and see the whole thing it would help. Yeah, like you sort of see the, the, um, the kind of camel figure, like the white sky. So it's like the sky could be mountains and then the mountains are like legs of this sort of dinosaur creature. And I used to, when I was a kid, I used to like see mountains and think, oh, what's underneath the mountain? Like with dinosaurs. And they kind of look like that, you know, at least around growing up in Los Angeles. So that was kind of like a play on this like constant scale shift where, where the painting really does have multiple reads to it. And it's not just one image, it's like kind of like three usually is, and then it's kind of all converging. So they read equally, you know, in your field. And then like you can see down below here are all these kind of falling dancing figures with horns and kind of animal heads. And it's kind of like a last judgment apocalyptic thing. And like Michelangelo's last judgment, the Sistine Chapel is kind of my main one, but it's like falling figures. And, you know, that's kind of like the traditional like last judgment depiction of like a, an apocalypse. I was, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at that. So. Um, I think it's really unusual and interesting. Um, and Caitlin, if you can go back to the whole picture that this painting is made over so much time. Like you lived with right. that dinosaur landscape, um, you know, for, I think that was 2014. And then you kept building around it, adding frame and the frame itself became a new image and then adding more frame and that frame becomes more image. So. That's, I mean, I think um, a slow and unusual and kind of like um, an approach to building an image that seems like, a, that can be likened to kind of world building because it has this kind of slow pace of like constructing a universe basically. Yeah, like you, yeah, like you said, it was done over, I actually, sh like, yeah, it was done over a lot of time. And like you're saying, I remember in the studio, you said, oh, it seems like they have no real beginning or end yeah. And I was like, really, I thought it was incredible. I never thought of that in that way. And then, and it's true, like even dating these, it's like, is it from 10 years ago? Cause that's when part of it was started. Like, when did it begin? And I showed this once like part of it and got it back and then added to it. And, yeah. and yeah, it just like kind of accumulates. So it takes up the sense of time. You feel it in person, especially, you know, that's I think one thing that's sort of lost like virtually or, you know, is in the size of this thing as well it's it's like seven feet or so so um yeah like it it was kind of it's this additive quality so it kind of has this voluminous sense of time that the painting seems to like it doesn't and it doesn't have a clear ending either like there's no you know like finish like we discussed there are no finishing moves you know so it's like it just sort of accumulates and for this show it's like I think because COVID really helped me and it kind of gave me an extra at least like six months you know to work which and I just went into these paintings so it was like a year and a half almost two years of just really working on these like 10 paintings and and I was able to just slowly accumulate you know the information and the light and the, the sort of the resolution of certain parts so that was and that gives a sense of time for the viewer. You know, it's obvious that this stuff took like years kind of, you know. Yeah, and they all sort of, yeah, you, it's, it's, it's palpable like when you're standing in front of them or especially as a whole. Um, you brought up at some point when we were looking at the linen part, how it's informed um, by looking at say Michelangelo's uh, Last Judgment and that in fact, the next slide I think we have is the linen lad's judgment piece. Um, which is part of a series, which I, I think is really interesting that it's one of nine, I think so far, which is um, interesting for many reasons. One, and since we're right now looking at this like panned out version, or it, it's okay to stay there. Yeah, thank you. Um, because these are made with also technology. They're made with a file that you can cut the wood into this like um, this form over and over again and make a series of paintings. They essentially have this kind of um, unconventional shape to them as a kind of lens, as a as a platform or as a receptacle. And then now, if you click in, and then they have these um, 
thank you. And then they have this kind of really, really detailed kind of um, uh, doodling, I guess, to, to use the word I was using earlier, um, stream of consciousness, drawing, painting. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about this, the, la the linen last judgment? And I guess I was connecting it also to imaging of the apocalypse, which you had brought up in the last piece. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as part of the series, I mean, really these came about because as like a meditation in the morning, a way to kind of warm up in the studio and like just have this whole expanse of linen and just go right in with a pen and just kind of go and like start drawing and I don't know, you know, just kind of things would like come out. It was kind of like automatic writing and it was a way to just like, I just, I really believe in drawing a lot, you know, and it was like a, not just as a warm up, but it just gets you more sensitive to the light and space and touch and you're feeling, it's like meditating, like you, you feel like you're going too fast or you're going too slow or you're not quite like finishing things or it just, the touch is off. It, it's just, it's like a, uh, uh, you're like really checking in with yourself and your kind of whole, your body and your mind and your hand and, and what your clarity of what you're imagining in your head, you know, and, and that's a huge part of it as a total like mental mind game, you know, and drawing is, is like the bone, you know, the bare bones, this is the skeletal structure. So it's just a great, good way to like warm up and get sensitive to space and, and comfortable with the, the time of, of creating. So I would just, you know, spend like a couple hours or whatever, some days, all days, but in the morning doing these. And that's why I've done a series just because they're like a kind of cathartic. They were more cathartic at first. It was a lot of like September 11th imagery that, you know, I saw the buildings like collapse from Bushwick and and always like stayed with me. And I have some pieces about that. And um, it's sort of like an apocalyptic scene, you know, and, and, and it's like, and then there's a lot of contemporary, like this, you see this building here. It's a, like a Louis Kahn building. And, and then there's a, you know, a Statue of Liberty comes out. So I might draw the Statue of Liberty and then it's holding a fire and then above the fire is like a cracked egg and there's an eagle, which is always the United States. And then there, you know, so there's like certain symbolisms that go throughout the whole piece. And the piece is like designed to just be like associatively created like piece by piece. And then I start like weaving the imagery together to kind of make these really funny narratives you know, of plugs coming out of someone's head or plugging into a dog's brain. Like, I don't, you know, and part of the ears connecting to the statue of Liberty. You know, it's just weird, like surreal stuff that kind of, I think is healthy. And it's sort of like my investment, like, whoa, this, I'm, I'm saying this is a value to spend your time this way, you know, to, to, to kind of explore this and give yourself time to let this stuff come out and then start to shape it and create these kind of world, these narratives. And then, like you said, it's kind of this futuristic vision of where we're going. And then there's, but it's filled with like last judgment, kind of historical figures and art his history. And, you know, it just has a funny play of stuff. And it's kind of designed like a big tapestry. This is about like six feet. So it's like you get up in it and you're just, there's, you're never going to see the same thing twice, really, because it's the way you travel through it is like any which way, you know, so that's a really important part to just get lost. And I think that's why people seem to like respond to these too is another reason I've kept making them. And, and I think people like that experience is like, it's freeing for people, for the viewer. Do some of the, thing, do some of the bits and parts of it end up kind of channeling, um, I don't know, information, news, entertainment, culture, like conversations that you're having in that moment? Like, do you end up kind of responding in this drawing form? I, I don't know, actually. Do you? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's lots of jokes and, and <laughs> stuff comes out that I don't, is embarrassing sometimes, or it's kind of, you know, it's, it's like, it's not violent, but there's like entwined bodies and it's erotic. And it's kind of like an adolescent, you know, like you say, you, you say doodling and like, I kind of cram like not doodling is like, you know, but it's true. It's like an adolescent drawing in class. You know, like I was always the kid in the back of class just drawing in my notebook all day, you know, and that's all I did. And it kind of has this, that scale of. 
But okay, so for an adolescent doodling, yeah, it sounds like um, not paying attention, but I think for an adult or in this case, it has more elements of kind of meditation. No, also like kind of transcending uh, rational thought into something that's more, um, I don't know, elevated spiritual channel. Yeah, but also like, you know, just a, a teenager, an adolescent, just wanting to get it out and not be, so it's kind of occupies this like high art and kind of low art yeah. dichotomy. And sometimes when I'm working, I mean, I'm trying to make a beautiful figure a lot of the time, you know, when I, when I really get more going, you know, the touch is really important and I'm trying to make good things. And there's parts that come out raw and other parts that come out very in much more elegant way. So mm -hmm. I kind of like straddle these two worlds and it's, it's a little schizophrenic kind of, mm -hmm. but I think it's like what people, what you respond to, you feel it, you feel this kind of urgency, it's expressive, right. you know, but I also wanted to make it really like good or, you know, try to get it right. right. I, and I definitely don't mean to devalue it by calling no, it no, no. Yeah. Like, because I think they are like such sophisticated drawings, like I couldn't draw like that. But um, there's another aspect of these that I think is really interesting, especially in LA, because I feel like, um, and as you were working on these, you know, when you were working on these in the fall, it was like fire season and pandemic. There was this kind of like poison air outside. There's a feeling of disaster everywhere in Los Angeles all the time. And I feel like that's um, sometimes channeled in, you know, the, the genre of the disaster film. It was something I thought a lot about while I was um, writing about your work, just like why we look or why we experience um, disaster or consume disaster for entertainment or for cathartic purposes, which is what you're describing. You're describing kind of like using the drawing practice as a place to kind of like um, exercise like all this um, thought or this kind of noise from outside. Um, and I remember, I know we talked about this, I wrote about it, but that you and your partner, Kate, talked about this idea of, um, in, a, in an interview that she wrote and that, that you guys published um, uh, about pure thought, that imagining or imaging the apocalypse is a kind of pure thought. I, I love that idea that you have. And mm -hmm. I think that it seems really related to um, something that you're aspiring to in making these paintings, like when you're looking for images, a kind of pure thought. Can you say more about that the idea of pure thought? Yeah, um, yeah, we could see more images might help me think of oh, what yeah. to say. And also, I did, I brought up the cinema thing also because there's this other element of time in your pieces like this one, um, which I think has the kind of film canister unfolding with the film strip kind of feel to it. Right, yeah. Yeah, this piece is, um, it's called Manzanita's Maze, uh, Zodiac Harps, of course. It's kind of like, there's that circle on the bottom, which is kind of like a Zodiac, a 12 part. Like I'm really into this 12 part circle, 12 hours, 12 months. And then it kind of like these, these sort of sequence of images wind around throughout the painting. And each one is like its own little kind of landscape or kind of Zodiac figure, mythological creature. And it kind of takes you through the painting in kind of like a maze way. And then in the bottom right is this sort of harp, zodiac harp. And it's kind of like an invented visionary kind of instrument that I just made up. But kind of imagine like music and order and harmony. Um, so yeah, that's the composition of this piece. And the um, I don't know, which, which should I add? You want to ask me another question? Like, sure. what, actually, what? one thing that comes to mind. Well, one thing that comes to mind is um, uh, music because it's a harp, and I feel like um, Alex Keefe wrote this really nice essay about your work in the book uh, that you published a few years ago that mentioned that your um, one of your parents was a music teacher, another was a historian or a history teacher. Mm -hmm. And these are really two different ways of keeping time, which I think is such a beautiful idea. But the yeah. harp here, which also kind of doubles as architecture. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, I don't mean to change that subject, but I think music seems to feature in your work in a lot of different ways. I wonder if you have anything to say about that and this piece. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I sort of think of like being an artist kind of like music is the best analogy for me as like being an artist. I, I always, when I ask myself, oh, questions about 
being a painter or a visual artist, I sort of like, well, what would a musician say to that mm-hmm. question, you know, or how would it, is it so different, you know? And I, to me, it's a lot of like staying, like, like playing, not playing an instrument, like you sort of stay in the fire, you know, you want to keep doing it every day. You want to kind of practice and you, I enjoy like improvising and playing and kind of writing music and composing, but it's visual really, you know, like it's, it's really not that different in my mind. And I want to kind of get lost and, and jam, you know, like that's kind of where it's at for me. And, and that's what I think is really a value. And if I'm doing that, then it kind of allows the viewer and the greater kind of world to do that as well, to kind of partake in my little, you know, develop like discoveries a little bit. So um, I have that idea of like of practicing and staying um, like f- fluid in the space and in the process of making. I mean, that's probably like the most basic way. And then also just the mathematical quantities and color theory and harmony is also super interesting, you know, that like harmony is, can be kind of agreed upon and color theory and color wheels can also be like, there's an accuracy there, like a truth factor in that, that I think is really important. And mm-hmm. even though color and space are often thought of as so kind of not like that, they actually do have a lot of objective quality. So, you know, I'm trying to like really listen, you know, to really see is in like a subtle kind of clear way, like listen to the, the harmonies of things and the echoes within a piece and getting the light, you know, like I, I love this, the illusionistic play of light. It is such a big part of like how I finish a lot of work too, is like creating this kind of subtle shimmery harmony in the end. And it's, it does feel like a symphonic kind of experience because there's these different shapes and these different areas that you're kind of like getting to shimmer together on this kind of big illusionistic, you know, plane that the painting that's kind of the nature of painting or of two dimensional work. So, you know, I mean, there's so many analogies to music. It, it never ends really, but. Um, Can we pull are- out of this piece a little bit just to get a sense of the composition that Zach was talking about? Yeah, just to get a sense for like these plays of light and reflection that you were mentioning. The, um, um, I remember hearing you talk about this piece that you sort of enter it a little bit off center into the center of those uh, geometric shapes. That's how you sort of create the composition, right? Yeah, I, sometimes I'll think of like a beginning and end point, mm-hmm. like a, a sequence of time as you travel through the piece, you know, and like mm-hmm. where you enter a painting is kind of like classic, you know, painting 101 or something. And I, I think a lot about that, or like the center of the painting, like how do you treat the center, these kind of timeless, like formal, I'm like, I'm super formal about so much of it, you know, and kind of rational as much as I can be. And that kind of sets me up to make a structure that then I can, like this piece, it, this, the composition is complex and it's like, I set myself up. I was like, okay, I, can, I could spend years just f- working on each little sequence of images. And it's like, so that's what it gives a sense of time of, of like, I, I've set up a structure that I can then like fill with, with spending time into different shapes and planes. So, um, yeah. Uh. Also in this piece, there's also um, the arabesque form that is a recurring shape throughout this show in particular, right? Like a geometry that keeps yeah. happening. Yeah, it's another one. Like, I think this is, yeah, I mean, it's like this, my most kind of unified show I've ever done. And I think part of it is the light and then this kind of arabesque. It's just the same kind of curve, like a French curve, I call it. And it's, but it's another form. It's like this kind of profound form of geometry that's this kind of organic. But as you start to replicate it and use it to construct, there's kind of like endless features that it kind of can come out in this iterations. So it's like throughout the show, again, I kind of just use these mathematical, you know, uh, units to, to create and to make everything kind of start bouncing off one another mm-hmm. when you're in the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really striking, but it's an experience that you have that's very, um, or I guess it's very experiential when you're looking at the pieces that there's a shift in scale with the same form. 
um, used right. professionally kind of. So I think that that creates a kind of perceptual shift that um, is almost ineffable. And actually I was thinking about, um, and this piece doesn't contain writing actually, but some of the other pieces do contain actual text. And I was thinking about how the arabesque form really does relate um, I want to talk about this one in just a moment, but how the Arabic form does really relate to a kind of language or kind of script. It has this like meaning embedded in it that's almost like calligraphic, you know, um, oh. because it's less uh, commonly used in architecture, but then um, here it really is sort of behaves architecturally in your pieces, the arabesque form as it sort of shifts in scale. Um, yeah. But actually this piece, um, the mushroom cloud does what a little bit of what you were talking about just a moment ago because um there's this center point to the piece right where the clouds meet that kind of catches the eye and then your eye kind of tumbles between the different places how did you structure this one because it looks kind of less mathematical in some respects than the other pieces but it actually is yeah i mean it's it's freehand and you know it had it's kind of funky and it's i just kind of like all those sort of cloud forms is all just lots and lots of curvature just all by hand over time just sort of figuring it out so the whole thing is like it it has a geometry on the sides of the piece but it's it's kind of like a little wonky and you kind of can't tell where things it's, it moves a lot as you look at it mm -hmm. um so there is this like underlying geometry but it's 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 really hand you know, it's like moving from inch to inch around it with my eye and kind of trying to gradate the planes and make the eye kind of move in and out of the, of the sort of oval. But um, yeah, so this one, it has that arabesque, like you're saying, but and like also the arabesque is kind of like furniture a little bit and it kind of makes, because the work kind of relates to like framing, you know, like the painting it has a frame and the frame, it's like the expanded field and like the frame expands to the wall or to the furniture around it. Like these things will probably live in someone's house or something. So I think about like the architecture and the window, the portal. Mm -hmm. And so the, the arabesque kind of touches on like traditional furniture kind of, and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, that's like another aspect to the work that I think is worth mentioning. Can we click into it a little bit just to look at some of the details? Yeah. Yeah. So this one's called Mushroom Cloud Vanity. And there's, this is like a play on mushroom cloud. There's mushrooms everywhere. But it's sort of a way to kind of create these like sort of little like logic fields, I would call them. Like each cloud has its own scale and its own kind of coloration. And it then sits in space in a specific way. So we get really into like the illusionist, where things sit in illusionistic space is to me like so um, important and exciting as a, and like something that is, is great to work with and I'm always sort of thinking about. So I think about like kind of ways to create that, um, that, that illusionistic space, which you can sort of see there. Yeah, and then there's like figures from kind of writhing around and then the part with the stripes is actually carved out. You know, it's about a quarter or a half inch deep in the center but then it's painted kind of like heightened, but not. And then there's also like reflective paint in the stripes. And a lot of the stripes have that. So like, you know, they're really about being approached, like how they look from far away. Then as you walk towards them, you know, you, obviously you don't see these people, you only see that up close. So I'm trying to kind of create, make it look good from far and close and everywhere in between. So that's like a big part of the resolution and also like kind of what you lose when it's online, like, you know, virtual like this, you're not getting that sense. So the metallic paint is like another way to kind of make the light move around as you move around the piece. So it kind of emphasizes the objecthood um, mm -hmm. of the piece. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're running close on time, but I, I really want to move through some of the other pieces. So um, maybe we can, yeah, click through this one slowly um, and then maybe land on, oops. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, this piece, and then we can kind of land on the um, fireplace, um, the painting over the fireplace piece, which is the next one. Yeah, thank you. I feel like a lot of what you're talking about, about the arabesque and also kind of like creating um, 
sort of perceptual space or the illusion exists in this work as well. Um, mm. Everything, including the level, but maybe you can go in on some details. Do you want to talk about this one a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a meta narrative of a painting over on a wall of a painting on a wall. And it's like a wood painting about a fireplace. So it has a little bit of this kind of sinister feel to it. You know, it's also like a, a trope, kind of like a joke that, um, you know, a painting above a fireplace, like that's where you hang a painting is above, above your mantle. So it's kind of like playing with that. And then, yeah, there's a sort of level up on top, but the level could sort of be like a, a um, you know, a, a light fixture, a ceiling. And so it's sort of like this whole meta world going on. And, and um, you know, like this part is a little painting in the middle or the top middle that's maybe, you know, a foot and a half by a foot. And it's actually like laser etched into a canvas panel, like all those little checkerboard you sort of see there and those little mountains that's like tiny, you know, like a centimeter by centimeter. So it's really small. So it's I could have worked with a lot of the laser, the technology to create these surfaces and then I'll kind of paint on them. I mean, that's how this one was made. Each one is really different, but, um, and then this one also like, again, it's like expanding from the painting to the wall and I designed like the wallpaper for it. I designed the ceiling, I designed the mantle, I designed, and it's like this glowing fire, kind of apocalyptic fire in the mantle. And, but then the reflection of it, like this little part is down on the bottom, is sort of like entwined kind of uh, yin yang figures, but it's like an inferno and there's kind of devils and, and that's down at the bottom. So that's like being reflected. So the reflection is not accurate. You know, it's like this, these two worlds of like high art up on the wall and then it's like inferno being reflected down below. And it's referencing like where this painting could be in someone's house and the surroundings. And it's also like very much, this is like totally on wood, wood inlay, the whole thing, like the mantelpiece. I don't know if there's a detail of it, but even just zooming out, you could say like the mantle is made of different pieces of wood inlaid. So it's like, I kind of was like being, you know, furniture designer, wallpaper designer, which was really say. fun. <laughs> I was gonna say it's like you you made a painting and then you create the context for that painting or it's like you're really starting to like pour out of the role of the painter into kind of like the the contextualizer of the painting. Um, yeah because that's like the future you know to go into these realms and to to use the language of technology and of, you know like transferring the vision not just being a painter but like in a illusionistic way but then working with these newer forms that can be reiterated in the future in any number of ways, I think is like so important and it gives an aesthetic to the pieces that's kind of like a little futuristic new agey and kind of what not hand done. And that's important. And that's like the world we live in is surrounded by that. And so I think like, it feels good to be, you know, in the future a little bit and to think that you, your ideas could like live out beyond now you know or you're not just making a little like bourgeois painting or something even though that's like what this is sort of and it's like a joke about yeah actually and I think humor is such a big part of all of these pieces um if we can click over to the next painting um you know there's also this question of like historical um, art historical references that you make in the work this particular piece is called Grand Street Boogie Woogie um, slash Orchard Street, because now it's, it's on Orchard Street, but um, it's a reference to Montréal's Broadway Boogie Boogie, Boogie, Woogie, right. Um, right? Uh, yeah. And I, I just think that this sort of conflation of references is really interesting also in your work, that there's always this kind of mishmash. On one hand, in terms of subject, there's this mishmash, mishmash of references and like, um, belief systems, you know, religion, symbols, mythologies, like recognizable images and things like that, that um, speak to a lot of different cultures, also a lot of different artists. And then also this kind of like mix of styles is kind of grafting or um, remixing of a lot of different uh, influences for you into the work. I, I feel like this piece is a really good place to talk about that, the way in which you kind of digest all this information and, and use it, present it, riff on it, riff on it, sort of like, 
poke at it, like you were just saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this one always looks like a, like a kind of analytic cubist space kind of flickering and the way it's constructed. So I think, um, yeah, people seem to see like a lot of influences in my work. Like it feels like there was a kind of dense art history there or something. And I did really, you know, like I lived in New York for 13 years and I spent like all my time at the Met, you know, and I traveled a lot to, you know, Italy and, and France and I went to India and Japan. And, um, you know, I have like, I've spent a lot of time in churches and, and kind of absorbing these different visual languages. And I think it kind of like, it all kind of through like osmosis, it kind of, it comes out in my work, not on purpose, but it just, it's like how I seem to judge things or I work things until they have for me, like a certain weight to them that maybe is kind of traditional or something. Um, and I just love looking at, at all, everything, you know, but painting especially. So yeah, my work has seemed to have a lot of influences, but then it's also each piece is pretty different and people seem to think like, oh, it's, it's unique and it's kind of original or outsider-y was like a description I used to get more, you know, when I was like doing more hand frames that were more funky and, you know, that was always like, a sort of description usually in reviews and stuff. So it still has some of that element to it a little bit, like a, but so it, it's kind of, is, again, it's this weird dichotomy of seeming like you can't quite place it. You know, I don't like it if like you see an artwork and you think of one other artist, like, oh, this person was influenced. This is like this, you know, it like it glitches the viewer kind of if, if you see too clear, like, one or two or three influences immediately kind of like oh I know this I've seen this you kind of judge it too easily and I think that's like a hard thing to yeah, try to deal with as an artist you know because so much has been said already and done and people are really like visually you know uh, intelligent and been around and yeah. there's a lot out there like in our culture visually so I see that in your work and I really appreciate that, that there's a trust of the viewer, like a trust that the viewer will kind of understand some of the references, you know, the aesthetic, the, the um, um, mode of entry into these different perceptual planes. Um, there's a real dialogue, I think, with the viewer in a lot of these works. I wonder if we could see a couple of details of this and then, thank you, and then arrive on the final painting that we have in our slideshow and maybe even open it up to a few questions so that we have time to sort of speak to people. I think this is also a really great one to kind of land on. One of the things that I didn't really manage to articulate when I was writing about your work, Zach, was um, mm -hmm. the idea of borders, actually, like the kind of, I mean, the frame, obviously, but there's a kind of borderlessness, even though there's so many, there's kind of so many distinct spaces within the pieces that it almost feels like there's no containment of it you know like and because over time it could keep building I thought this was this one is particularly interesting because it has such an unconventional shape um but also the arabesque form I don't know I, I don't actually have an argument about it that's why I couldn't put it in writing but I am really interested in this one in particular and sort of its edges um so maybe you could uh -huh. say a little bit about that and then I'll pull up the questions so you can answer some yeah. of the public yeah, I mean this piece it's called Zodiac Scroll, but it's it's like a kind of a calendar, like a week of Sunday. And you see like, so each each kind of layer is like a day. And it sort of says Sunday, Saturday, S-F-T-W-T-F. So it's like days of the week kind of just going back in space and time. So that's like a lot of times I like to underlie that the images have like another kind of calendar time symbolism. I always try to kind of work into the images. So that's kind of like the, one of the kind of secondary narratives I'd call it of this piece. And then there's kind of like these sort of butterfly evolving forms coming up. And then there's the kind of become like clouds up above. And then in the top, there's like a centaur figure and it's all kind of emanating from one from the top corners, like the kind of all seeing eye just kind of emanating the logic and the order onto the each day of the week so it's this kind of that's kind of like the symbolism of it for me and they're like all the time is all going coming from one place 
or it's like this sort of monotheism, you know, in formal terms or something. So, and it's also very sculptural and, you know, I just enjoy like making the forms of this thing and then the stripe parts are carved and then the sort of like uh, uh, butterfly forms are carved with like a Dremel right into the surface of the wood. So it's, it's pretty hand done. And then there's like subtle shifts in the depth. And um, there's also, it's like CNC milled and there's pastel. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, actually yeah. the, the first question that we have kind of connects to what you were just saying about um, uh, like just kind of various like uh, icons or, or images of belief systems. It says, looking at the last judgment piece, this is a question um, from Sandra. Looking at the last ju the judgment piece just now made me think of looking at the Jane manuscript painting of its cosmology. I'm projecting, of course, but just wondering if there are any nods to the far Eastern philosophies slash religious beliefs. Thank you. So I think, I feel like we kind of answered that a little bit, but do you want to talk more about that? How you kind of include um, various systems of beliefs in your, in your work and which ones you reference, which ones kind of make their way into your work? So the question is, yes. like, the question is, is um, I'm wondering if there are any nods to far Eastern philosophies slash uh -huh. religious beliefs. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, not again, not on purpose, but um, I mean, it's, I don't know, <laughs> painting is kind of like, I mean, being an artist is like its own religion a little bit. And you know, the, the meditative quality is, is there. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm not, not particularly, you know, I don't, I don't know if all the, the categorization even helps really in a way of calling something religious or not, you know, like, you know, I would, I would say no, you know, not, not overtly, but it's there, like I love Indian miniature, you know, or like Zen calligraphy. I mean, there's a lot in that I, I feel like is kind of in the work, but as far as like it becoming, going into like the religious realm, you know, I, would, I wouldn't really go there, you know? I think that can like kind of speak for itself and it doesn't need to be like categorized or something. I don't know, I'm not, I feel like yes, there is, is my answer. Like I feel like yes, but I don't know, I can point to it per se. You know, I'm sure I'll think of a good answer for this like tonight, but. Yeah, maybe we can yeah. add answers later. I mean, I feel like I've heard you talk about the way in which you use religion or you kind of bring together, um, belief systems is a good way to put it because I think it brings together like new age belief, like kind of like faith in psychedelics with um, old um, and uh, with, with ancient religions with, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's there's a way in which I think the, the images can't be placed, like you were just saying about kind of art historical references, uh, that they they evoke different belief systems, but they can't actually just like sit within one or sort of be informed by one. I don't mean to answer that question for you. Here's no, a question. Sure yeah. <laughs> Here's a question from um, Matt Ross. Question. As an artist who seems to move around the work rhythmically, how do you deal with the moment in the studio when you aren't feeling it or not happy with the sound you're making? Well, yeah. Oh, that's Matt. Yeah, he, he, yeah Matt. He's a musician. Um, yeah, that's, the, that's, I mean, every day is a struggle, honestly. You know, I, get, I feel really lost like all the time. And, you know, you like sweep your studio or clean up or stretch or, you know, do yoga, like, I don't let myself take enough breaks, probably, but I should take a walk or something. But it's, you know, I think also like having different kind of modes you can go into depending on what you feel like you can do, you know, whether it's just like designing a shape or like just drawing a little like in a limit last judgment, you know, just saying, you know, like I'm thinking about too much, it's hard to focus, maybe I should just sit here for an hour and try to just draw a little bit in one little area and just keep it at that, you know, and then try to build from there. So, you know, you, you have like different kind of modes you can jump into depending, you know, on how you're feeling, but it's, it's, it's really hard, you know, and it's like doing it like a job too. It's like eight hours a day kind of thing is, 
it doesn't help either, but, but it also does help because you're kind of in a rhythm of it. So it's, it's tricky, it's, it's a hard thing, you know, and then silence and do you listen to music or not? And how, you know, there's, there's a lot you can get involved in. So it's, yeah. Uh, that's a good answer. Um, I will give you the last question and then maybe if you have any final notes. Um, the, the next question is, could Zach discuss painting over the fireplace? And potentially we, we did actually, if you cut back over to that painting, but perhaps there's more to be said about it. I feel like this one was the first one that really captured my heart. So I am curious oh, really? to hear you talk more about it. Oh, yeah, it's the uh, level on this one is not a real level. It's a painted level, right? It has a real one. Oh, this one yeah. has the real one, because some of them are not real. We didn't have details of all of them, but right. um, is there anything that we forgot to say about this one? It's so otherworldly. Well, tell I'm curious, could you tell me why you liked it or why it captured your heart? Um, well, yeah, you know, it's interesting because it's a painting within a painting, you know, like you said, on a piece of furniture within a wallpaper, like there's this kind of tumbling in that happens in it but also it feels like just the beginning kind of like by being like so put together in these different ways, like a kind of like a Lego set for lack of better language. Um, um, it feels like it's, it's waiting for more. So it, it sort of has a sense of open possibility. And I feel like when I was in your studio, once you talked about this kind of like um, fantasy really of like, whenever you exhibit paintings, getting them all back afterwards and keeping on building on them and kind of like never making new, just like adding and adding and adding and continuing to add on these like, on these ecosystems. I really see that in this one because I see, you know, the infinite regress of the, the arabesque, how it's recurring at different scales and how it's being used in different ways and how um, it begins with a sense of being in a room and then on a piece of furniture and then within a world, you know, so. Um, I think it it says a lot. Do you like this piece? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Like it has a kind of, it's it's like a platonic place mm -hmm. where it's it's like they could be these forms could be reiterated in any number of ways or mm -hmm. yeah or this like everything is like connected by this underlying form and then which has just been added to. Yeah, it has that feel like or it, it, yeah or more could be made from these things or parts of it could be like dissected and become its own painting or thing as well. Um, yeah, I think platonic is a really good way to put it because it kind of puts everything into question is what I'm saying. When I look at this piece, I kind of question everything around it. Yeah, kind of like a lot of people don't see the fireplace at first, like the mantle, mm -hmm. which is like, I'm, that's always kind of the first thing I see, you know, and so that's interesting. It's like what, so it's sort of like really realistic in a certain way. You can like really feel like you're almost down on the floor looking up into this space. And it really does look like a, like the, the frame around the painting on the wall is, does come up in relief a little bit. So it casts a slight shadow. So it, there's these like little bits of that going on that, you know, you don't necessarily see right now, but so it, it's like really realistic in this one read. And then it's also like totally just kind of floating and like hanging together in this other way, which kind of is is a, is is fun. You know, it keeps it kind of interesting. Like you can't quite place what's going on. And then yeah, like the sort of reflection of the fireplace is like this kind of visionary landscape. Like you're just tripping out on the on a fire, looking at the shadows of a fire, and like seeing landscapes in it in the reflection of a fire. So it's Maybe it's like Plato's cave or something, like mm -hmm. these levels of, of, you know, what's real, what's illusory or something. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's a good uh, note to end, end on. Good but. place to end, I love it. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Zach.